video podcast 31 from learningradiology.com, Radiation Induced Diseases. Hello, I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. Today we're going to talk about the effects of radiation on the GI tract in producing esophageal strictures and radiation enteritis, on the musculoskeletal system in producing radiation osteonecrosis and radiation-induced bone tumors, on the lungs in producing radiation pneumonitis and radiation fibrosis, and then a little bit about thoracrast. Radiation therapy is usually delivered in relatively small doses to relatively small volumes of tissue over a period of time, usually a matter of weeks, which is called fractionation. And all means are used to deliver the highest possible dose to the tumor while sparing the normal tissue adjacent to the tumor. The most rapidly dividing cells are the ones that are usually the most radiosensitive. The cytocytal effects of radiation are mostly due to free radical production. Many side effects of radiation are mediated through a vasculitis secondary to damage to the endothelial cells. And damage rarely occurs at doses less than 40 gray or 4,000 rads but is more common at doses of greater than 50 gray or 5,000 rads. Let's talk a little bit about the units of absorbed dose in radiation. The unit that had previously been used was called the rad for radiation absorbed dose and one rad was defined as one hundredth of a joule of deposited energy per kilogram of tissue. Today the unit that is used to express absorbed dose is called the gray. One gray is equal to one joule of deposited energy per kilogram of tissue, and therefore one gray is equal to 100 rads. We'll use both gray and rads in the course of this talk. Esophageal strictures. Esophageal strictures usually require mediastinal radiation of greater than 50 gray or 5,000 rads. This is frequently delivered for carcinoma of the esophagus itself or of the lung or for lymphoma. The symptoms are progressive dysphagia, usually starting several months after the end of radiation therapy. Esophageal strictures produced by radiation therapy tend to be long and smoothly tapered strictures. They usually occur in the upper and mid-esophagus, and they can be differentiated from recurrent tumor by the fact that recurrent tumor is usually much more nodular than a radiation stricture. This is an example of a radiation stricture of the esophagus. You can see that there is a long, smoothly tapered stricture of the upper portion of the esophagus. This patient received radiation for a carcinoma of the lung. Radiation enteritis. The mucosal cells are the most sensitive in the gastrointestinal tract, followed by the vascular endothelial cells. Symptoms of radiation enteritis include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. And some of the factors which can potentiate or accelerate radiation damage include bowel that is fixed in a certain location by prior surgery and its adhesions, certain chemotherapeutic agents, and the patient's age the presence of atherosclerosis, or the concomitant presence of diabetes. The imaging findings in chronic changes, usually 45 gray or greater than 4,500 rads are needed. About 5 to 15 percent of patients receiving x-ray therapy to the abdomen and pelvis will develop some of the symptoms of radiation enteritis. And the findings are secondary to an obliterative vasculitis, which leads to bowel wall thickening, narrowing, and irregularity of the lumen, sometimes thumb printing due to submucosal infiltration. The key to the diagnosis of radiation-induced enteritis is that the changes so produced are confined to a prior radiation portal. This is an example of radiation enteritis in a female who received external radiation for endometrial carcinoma. The red arrow is pointing to a loop of jejunum that is fixed in place that has a narrowed lumen and irregular margins. 
and the blue box is showing you approximately the size of the radiation portal. This is another individual who had a much larger portal. The entire abdomen was irradiated for ovarian carcinoma. And you can see the red arrows are pointing to multiple loops of jejunum in which the wall is thickened. There is some mucosal infiltration, which is causing a picket fence appearance to the wall. Radiation changes in bone. These usually require at least 30 gray or 3,000 rads to occur. There are several different radiation changes that can be seen in bone. In growing bone, growth disturbances can be seen in the form of scoliosis in the spine or retarded growth of long bones. Radiation osteonecrosis is a form of avascular necrosis produced by radiation. It is especially common in the mandible. And rarely, radiation can induce the production of a bone tumor years after the radiation is delivered. This is a young female who had radiation to her entire right hemithorax for Hodgkin's disease that involved the right lung years earlier when she was a teenager. You can appreciate, I think, that the right hemithorax is slightly smaller than the left hemithorax, a manifestation of growth disturbance. In addition, the right breast is smaller than the left breast, and there are radiation changes in the right hilum and fibrosis in the right apex. Radiation osteonecrosis usually requires doses in excess of 50 gray or 5,000 rads. We may see osteopenia, osteosclerosis, or coarsening of the trabecular pattern. There may be round or sometimes oblong shaped lucencies in the bone. A key differentiating factor between radiation-induced osteonecrosis and other diseases is that it, radiation osteonecrosis, occurs in the radiation portal. And it usually takes many years, sometimes decades, to appear. This is an example of radiation osteonecrosis of the mandible. Inside the red circle, you can see that a portion of the body of the mandible is osteopenic. A portion of the alveolar ridge is destroyed. And on the CT scan of the mandible, you can see that a portion of the cortex in the area that underwent radiation osteonecrosis is not as thick as the normal cortex. This is an example of radiation osteonecrosis of the clavicle in an individual who was irradiated for breast carcinoma and who received a portal of radiation to the supraclavicular nodes. You can see that the right clavicle has a somewhat thickened cortex and a coarsening of the trabecular pattern, which actually resembles the findings that you might see in Paget's disease, except it is confined to the radiation portal. Radiation-induced bone tumors are rare. Osteosarcoma is the most common, but undifferentiated fibrosarcomas are nearly as frequent. Head and neck tumors are the most common site. The mandible in adults and the orbits in children, secondary to radiation for retinoblastoma. You should suspect a radiation-induced osteosarcoma or fibrosarcoma when pain and swelling occur in an irradiated area years after the conclusion of treatment. This is an individual who received both external and internal radiation for carcinoma of the cervix. The red and white arrows are pointing to something called a Fletcher's applicator, which is used to deliver radiation using sources of cesium or radium directly to the tumor itself. This individual also received external radiation in a portal about what the blue box shows. And many years later, you can see that there is an osteolytic lesion in the right acetabulum with a pathologic fracture, which is shown by the white arrow. When biopsied, this was an osteolytic osteosarcoma. Radiation pneumonitis and fibrosis. Radiation-induced lung disease, or RILD, almost always occurs greater than 40 gray, or 4,000 rads. It usually occurs in two stages, first radiation pneumonitis and then chronic radiation fibrosis. Radiation-induced lung disease, in general, appears about six weeks to six months after radiation therapy treatments. CT is a more sensitive means of demonstrating the changes of radiation on the lung than our conventional radiographs.
On CT, we can have ground glass opacities at first, then patchy areas of consolidation, and finally well-demarcated areas of fibrosis that correspond to the radiation portal. Radiation pneumonitis can be seen as early as one week, but usually about six weeks after the completion of treatment. Patients complain of a non-productive cough and shortness of breath. The changes are confined to the radiation portal. On CT, we may see a non-uniform ground glass appearance with patchy consolidation sometimes on conventional radiographs. This is an example of radiation pneumonitis in the right lung in an individual who was being treated for breast carcinoma with external radiation. On the conventional radiograph, you can see that there is airspace disease in the right lower lobe. And on the CT scan, there is a dense ground glass pattern with air bronchograms seen in the right lung. Radiation fibrosis implies permanent damage. It's confined to the radiation portal. There is usually a loss of volume associated with radiation fibrosis. It's diagnosable because it presents with a shape that is extremely unusual for a natural disease. There may be bronchiectasis in the radiation portal as well as pleural thickening. And this is an example of radiation-induced fibrosis in the lung. You can see that the disease occurs in a pattern which is most unlike that of a naturally occurring disease having straight edges and 90 degree corners which correspond exactly to this portal film that shows where the radiation portal was when the external radiation was delivered. This is another example that shows the same findings of a very sharply demarcated area of increased density in the right hilar region with very sharp angles as its edges. There's also radiation fibrosis in the right apex. Thoratrast represents an unfortunate chapter in the history of radiology. Thoratrast is thorium dioxide, and it was used from the 1930s through the 1950s because it was an excellent contrast agent for performing cerebral angiography. It was also used for visualizing the liver and the spleen. One of its side effects was that it did produce a desmoplastic, a fibrotic reaction if it partially extravasated and uh, got into the soft tissue surrounding the vein into which it was being injected. It was deposited in the liver, the spleen, the reticular endothelial system, and besides being radio-opaque to external radiation, it was in fact radioactive and it produced alpha particles. Alpha particles have a relatively large mass and they are very highly absorbed immediately around the source of the alpha emitter. Thoratrast also had a biologic half-life of 400 years, which means it lasted well beyond the normal lifetime of an individual. And since it was deposited in the liver, spleen, and reticular endothelial system and remained there forever, Many years after it was used, individuals who received it began to manifest hemangioendotheliomas in the liver, hepatomas, and cholangiosarcomas. This is an example on conventional radiography of thoratrest deposition 20 years after it was administered in the liver. The white arrow is demonstrating uptake in the liver. In the celiac lymph nodes, the black arrow, and the red arrow in a contracted spleen. So this compound, again, was not only radio-opaque, for which it was being used in the first place as a contrast agent, but it was radioactive. And this is a CT scan of another individual that shows that the liver, the white arrow, is uniformly dense because it contains thoratrest. The red circle is showing uptake in some of the celiac nodes, and the yellow arrow is showing uptake in a very dense spleen. It's time for your mini quiz. So the entire session has been on radiation-induced changes. This person has radiation fibrosis of their lung, as you can see is manifest by the irregularity in the right paramediastinal region on the conventional radiograph and in the fibrosis with bronchiectasis in the same area that we see on the CT scan. The question